Welcome back, everybody. We are live for another episode of Growing with My Fellow Growers. I'm your host, Jack Greenstock, joined as always by an amazing panel. I look forward to seeing these guys every week. So I'll pass it over first to Spartan Grown. Welcome back. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jack. What's up, everybody? I'm Spartan Grown. You can uh, find me on Instagram at Spartan Grown, all one word. I'm an organic and synthetic or synthetic grower here in Michigan. If you have any questions, you can shoot me a DM there or you can send me an email at spartangrown at gmail.com and I'll try to answer your question there. Glad to have you back. And next up, we got Brandon Russ. Going on, guys. I'm Brandon Russ. Always uh, happy to be here with the rest of the panel. Um, you can find me at rust.brandon on Instagram and you can find a link to my company, Bokashi Earthworks, and our farm, Black Label Organics. Welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you. And next up, Kyle Breeder. Yeah, hey everybody. My name is Kyle Breeder. Uh, I specialize in feminized seeds. If that's what you're looking for, I do have a website, which is the letter P followed by breeding.com. Uh, I do have a new seed drop with uh, a really great breeder from Green Bodie coming out soon. So uh, everybody should be looking out for that coming out soon. And you can find any of my material or reach out to me on any social media platform at Pure Breeding. Excited to hear more about that drop. I know uh, I've had a personal. Uh, connection with some of Green Bodie's work here in California, and it's definitely some good medicine. Helped a lot of patients, and uh, I'm glad to see you working with uh, other good breeders. I love seeing that collaboration. Speaking of collaboration, we have a person who's all about the spirit of collaboration, Dr. MJ. Hey, yeah, Dr. MJ Coco here from CocoForCannabis.com. Absolutely a big fan of the spirit of collaboration. I'm happy to be back with all of you guys again this week and look forward to a great show. Thanks to everybody for joining us. We're happy to have you back and always good to see the people in the chat, the live chat moving along quickly. I'm having a hard time keeping up already and it's only three minutes into the show. Um, people are putting those messages out there. I got to go over to live chat on my phone. I got it live on the computer as well now. Next up, we got Aaron the Grower. Welcome back. What's up, Jack panel? Good to see everybody again. Um, I am Aaron the Grower, ATG Acres on Instagram, YouTube, and ATGAcres.com. Uh, good to be back. Looking forward to today. Happy to have you back. And somebody that you recently did an insect vision conversation with. Well, not so recently, I guess, anymore, but still good information and related to our last week's conversation. But uh, next up, and last and certainly not least, Matthew Gates. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, I'm Matthew Gates, and I'm an integrated pest management specialist. For those who don't already know in the audience, um, you can find my content about pests and plant health uh, in three major places, my Twitter and Instagram, which is at Sync Angel, and also on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, which is the main glut of that information. There is a lot of it on that channel. Um, it's always nice to use the search bar on YouTube and then type Xenthanol in there, and it always pops up. Like, if you want to look up Sentinel spider mites, you'll find like two spotted spider mite, and then it'll give you the pest primer and a whole bunch of other inf information. So that's how I do it for anybody, anybody out there trying to sort through all that great information. It is a very awesome resource for us to have. So thank you again for joining us. And I was curious uh, how everybody's doing this week. I know recently in Michigan, I've seen some stuff that I love to see. And mainly Spartan Grown actually was one of the leaders of the charge. He personally printed out one of the house bills, read through it himself, and uh, did a few Instagram lives about some of the things that he disagreed with and felt that enough people weren't paying attention to. So Spartan, I wanted to throw it over to you to maybe give some of your thoughts on that and how the, you know, I think you guys marched on the Capitol and uh, gave your stance and just maybe an update on how things are going over in Michigan. Sure. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah. So let me see. I'm trying to put the series of events in my head kind of in order, but so long well, a really quick backstory is, is that uh, like in most corporate or most in most businesses um, in Michigan, the, the biggest corporations, the biggest players in the cannabis field that have multiple stacked licenses and things like that, they take their profit, some of their profits and they donate it to a, a lobby group called the MCMA, which is the Michigan Cannabis Manufacturers Association. And the MCMA has been secretly lobbying to lobbying lawmakers and regulators to make regulations and laws that benefit them and push out their competition or what they see as competition. And right now they have their targets on home growing and caregiving, you know, the whole thing that started the medical market in Michigan. 
So they've pushed this bill. It's been introduced into the House at the state level here in Michigan. And in this bill, it peels back a lot of the rights that we have as caregivers here in Michigan and some uh, home home uh, manufacturer, I guess you call it, uh, being able to make edibles is, I mean, this bill under the language in this bill, you wouldn't even be able to infuse oils or, or, or butters or anything like that. So um, obviously once I started seeing these things, I printed out the bill. So at first I, it's, it's a suite of bills. It starts with 5,300, it goes, in sequential order all the way to 5003, I believe. It might go to four. And um, the good thing that we have for going for us here in the state of Michigan is, is these laws were put into place by the people. We voted, we pushed it through petition and put it on the, on the ballot so that we were able to vote it in. Because we did that and we voted it in, that it's going to take a two-thirds supermajority for the uh, House to be able to overturn anything that we voted in. And so that's a pretty tough ask in today's government uh, landscape because they're so, you know, at each other's throat. But at the same time, I'm not going to sit back and just let that shit happen. So I did what I can do. You know what I mean? I, I leveraged what uh, to be able to get the word out there to get people to know what's going on. So I just started doing videos on my Instagram, letting people know what it's about. Um, we'd organized a rally at the state capitol. We all showed up there on the 15th of September. And probably a good 500 people at the peak of it were there on a Wednesday in the middle of the week, which was awesome. We got media coverage, all kind of, you know, all kinds of good stuff. And um, it was very peaceful, too. From what, everything I saw, it was people just saying what they believed and uh, everybody. There was no drama or anything like that so exactly right even though the uh, mcma paid for a billboard truck you know those trucks that have the signs on them to park in the very first parking spot right in front of the state capitol with their billboard on it but you know that's just them playing their stupid dirty games and they just don't understand they don't understand the cannabis community that i don't know what they were trying to do there but uh we didn't take the bait we didn't do anything to their truck you know what i mean it's just it's the same old stupid games that they always play. So we're just beating them at their own game. We threw up the boycott for all of these companies that are affiliated, that we know are affiliated with the MCMA. We're asking people not to purchase their products because uh, that's just going to fund, you know, instead of them making profits and being happy with it, they're taking these profits and trying to make sure that nobody can home grow. They want to be the only ones that can grow cannabis. So, uh, yeah, we're just uh, pushing against them. I've called all... All the people that were the sponsors of the bill, they've all gotten emails from me. They've all gotten phone calls. My own state rep um, I've been in contact with. And um, right now at the state rep, we've jumped on this so early that it hasn't even gotten out of committee yet. So it's been introduced. It's got to get out of committee before it can be voted on. So right now we're a little bit, uh, you know, jumping the gun by getting a hold of our reps, but we're making them aware of it. We're making them aware of it so that if it does pass, that they'll know how we feel. And well, letting them know that you don't want change community. before it's yeah, even exactly. proposed. Say, hey, we're not even, yeah, we're not even asking for a change. Right? That's the biggest thing is we're just asking for them to leave the laws alone. Just leave them alone. What's crazy is, is there's a commercial entity through the MCMA trying to affect laws in the caregiver market, which has got nothing to do with the commercial market. That alone should be illegal. But, uh, you know, whatever. Oh, it but it does you. because people think that, or because that's going to have an influence on the like, perhaps like net possible influence they could perhaps have. I mean, that's just speculation. Well, they see it as all profit. So every right. single piece of cannabis, whether it's uh, a concentrate, a flower, a oil, whatever it is, they want a hundred percent of the sales mm -hmm. of all of it. So they want to shut down home growers. This shows you how powerful home growing is. If they're willing, okay. It might be a percent. It might be 1% of their, they might make a hundred million dollars a year and 1% or 10%, whatever it is. They, I've heard $10 million for lobbying against home growing and basically caregivers rights. So if they're willing to spend that much money, it shows you that they're trying to make much more than that in their profits by owning this market and people growing their own really can hurt their bottom line to the tune of more than $10 million, especially with a strong caregiver market and a bunch of people that are home growing, more people learning every day with shows like this and Michigan Bros Grow Show and many others 
that are making people aware of uh, doing the right things of like just calling your senator, emailing them. If you inundate these people, they're human beings. They hear it over and over and over and they want politics as a game of popularity. And if they get a bunch of people calling and saying, we want this. And if you, they go against it, they know they're going to have a bunch of pissed off people that are politically charged and active. They don't want to do that most of the time. So if you can get yeah. one third of them say no to change, you'll be successful. And I think that Michigan well, you're is absolutely that right. right. I mean, we've already had the chair, the head of the chairperson, the MCMA step down. Um, and they had some, they put somebody else in place, obviously, but, um, We've had uh, several companies now back out of the MCMA lobby group. And so we're hurting them. You know, we're doing things. We're, 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 we're making them. They're so pissed. They've, they've introduced this bill that's like outrageously overreaching. Obviously, we're pissing them off. You know what I mean? We, they, we had their website. The MCMA website was down for over a month. They took it down. I mean, just because we clowned them on their own, on their own pictures. You know what I mean? It's just... <laughs> Since yeah, spider mites and shit I've on their planes. In, since I've been in uh, the legal side of things, I've learned a couple of things. Okay. And one of those things is that one of the ways that politicians and lawmakers, uh, people who are in positions of power, try to profit off of cannabis is through lobby groups, right? Because a lobby group basically is a legal bribe. Uh, and what they do is they'll have legislation drafted and then they'll pay lawmakers to try to push it into, um, into the legal system. And what the lawmakers don't care if it gets passed because they're going to get paid by the, the, the lobbyists, whatever, they're going to get some type of benefit, whatever that is. But they're more than happy to have another group or organization come in and do like a counter lobby group where they come back. And it's almost like a back and forth game where they can basically stay neutral. They don't give a shit really what happens because they're impartial to cannabis one way or the other. And they're basically just like these different groups of people are essentially going, hey, we're going to pay to change the laws. This group is going to go, oh, no, we're going to fucking pay to keep things the same. And it just creates this, I guess, I mean, this, this, and I know this firsthand because this is what happened out in Hawaii. They had tried to pass this bill. It would have taken away um, the ability for like farms to stack cards for multiple plant counts at a single site. And they literally had to hire another lobby group to go like contest the lobby group that introduced the bill and tried to have it passed to begin with. So it's really just they just want to see money thrown around the, the people who are in these positions. That's the way I feel about it. Right. It's it like sounds a, like a, a vortex of income for lawmakers. Once one lobby yeah. group starts, it just it's just a spiral. Well, it's like That's, follow the money. A lot of people say with politics and with the lobby groups, it's like, so you've got the cannabis lobby group over here who wants the laws, whether it's the MCMA or a different group, <clears throat> whoever they want cannabis laws to be a certain way. And then there's even laws that are just anti-cannabis. There's like yeah, the mothers totally. against cannabis yeah. groups that have people that come and say, people are overdosing and dying on cannabis in California. This is happening in 2021. I've been going to council meetings where like my wife was advocating for her delivery service to have more access and there was still these people quoting saying oh we have thousands of studies that show cannabis you know does all these terrible things that then they never provide any of the data they just come in droves and say this shit over and over and over to the politicians enough times to try and scare them into voting against it and make them think that there is this it's really a vocal minority because like in the case of the city I was in 70 plus percent of people voted for cannabis. So then they had a few people come in and whine and complain. And then the council people were like, Oh, we're going to wait a year and see how it works out for everybody else and then see what we'll do. And now they're finally slowly starting to move forward despite having seven out of 10 people in their city voting. Yes. And it's like, that's pretty strong support for them to just sit on their hands, but they have the ability to do it because like Brandon mentioned, they can get paid by both sides. They could, <laughs> and it's not directly, they get paid with, uh, you know, campaign donations, and then they are introduced to bill 
that same day that they get a $50,000 campaign donation from whatever group or pack, a super pack, because like Citizens United allows people to act as a business and donate. They usually wait a week, dude. They usually wait at least a week. <laughs> oh, is that so? <laughs> well, that's what, you know, that's, that's what all the lot on the street I've been reading is always fucking recommends at least a week difference, but yeah, I don't know, man. The one thing you have to remember is when you look at it that way, you, you're looking at a problem that looks like an elephant, right? And you got to eat that fucking elephant. Don't look at that elephant. Look at that toe. Just eat that fucking one toe. bite Tomorrow, at a time. Eat another toe. Yeah. <laughs> one bite at a time. You take that fucking elephant down. And I'm telling you, you can be a lobbyist too. You can go down there just like a fucking lobby can and stand outside that senator or congressman's or congresswoman's or congressperson's uh jack jack summed office. it up he, he said he said those few vote that few vocal minority was able to hinder progress right so if you could be that that counterparty who's also active and has a voice and you can build up a, even just a small following that's at all of those meetings that are constantly there I mean, when you start affecting the That's people what we're doing, who man. are we're making just, the laws yeah. and they take notice, man, and they and they get fed up and they're like, look, these people are going to keep coming after us either with legal teams or they're going to, you know, then. The squeaky yeah, wheel gets whole, the grease, I mean, there's man. people way before me that, yeah. that I'm leaning on to, like, uh, you know, Rick Simpson, who sits on the cha chairperson normal. And we got Jamie Lowell who's been a freedom fighter forever in the state of Michigan. He owned part owner of the first dispensary here in Michigan. So we have big hitters on our side that are helping us. It's just that we yeah. need to, we just need to, the community you know, needs to mobilize come everybody. I mean, and we are. So the, the, the lead sponsor of the bill, Jim Lilly, he, his office from uh, medical shout out to medical Mondays too, for helping spread the word. They're doing a lot of this for us too. And, uh, on the last medical Mondays, they were saying how people were calling into that office and the office was trying to claim that that wasn't even his office anymore. They started to say, oh, this is, you have the wrong number. This is not his office. So good. You know what I mean? It's obviously making, making life a little difficult. So that's what I like to see. So we're doing it. It's just, you know, you're not going to hear about every single little story that goes on. You're not going to hear about every single person that calls their center and has that conversation. I've been getting DMs from people that have gotten responses back from their local representative and they wanted more information. Like they were on their side. They're like, well, we didn't, haven't heard about this. What's give us more information. So, you know, I just tell them, reach out to me or whoever you need to reach out to, we'll get you that information. But uh, no, it's, it's helping. I, I really have, I really doubt, I would be surprised if this thing passed, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. It hasn't even left committee yet, but uh, we're still holding their feet to the fire. It is good to look at the companies that are responsible for sponsoring. That's what they're hiding. See, they took their website down. They used to have on their website, their MCMA website, they used to have like a handful of their biggest members and they were toting themselves as the big three of the cannabis industry. And that's, that's really uh, for the Midwest, for Michigan, especially to call yourself the big three. That's like the automotive companies here in Michigan. So they're trying to like pull it our, heartstrings by calling themselves the big three or whatever so they were really cocky but then their splash screen they're clever they're clever they're pulling an emotion if you can make somebody feel something yeah whether it's right or wrong whether there's facts behind it or not they're going to remember it so they call it the big yeah three. that big Our three thing has even more to do with sort of the cultural ethos that the, there should be three big car companies exactly. and other company. uh -huh. they're trying they're trying to uh appeal to all these guys that just want to throw money into this lobby so that they can be part of the big three you know what i mean oh we're in the same group as the big three that's that's it's a framing what I see yeah. but it's anybody who worked for the big three who has a connection to the big three or still work for the big three the retirements are dependent on those big three they have a positive association with it so these lobbyists are not stupid in what they're doing so i think what you're doing spartan is some of the well, most there's powerful. a reason behind yes. it too, though you know these companies they can't function and be profitable with the allocated shares that they have all over the place when you have multiple investors that have invested you know millions of dollars and then you can't get a, that projected return look i have four partners we're all 25 percent and we can 
run a company and bring in income, but we're not all getting rich. You know what I mean? Like we're just fucking getting by and you have to love what you do at the end of the day. But a lot of people don't understand that. And they think that they can come in, try to take over market share with, you know, maybe a subpar product because they can, you know, they have big ass facilities, but it, it doesn't work like that because, well, it, that's why they're trying to change the law so that it that's, does. Work. That's, I, that's that's my point. That's the yeah. point is because that's why they're doing it is because they can't sustain operate a profitable business with the model that they set up because they didn't understand how cannabis works. Like, exactly. it seems like they're trying to apply this model that ha- that spreads through corporations. That's sort of like. Um, it's like there's th- big three in everything. So like the, if you look at the car industry, you know, you have three big corporations that are umbrellas for every other car company and they deceive media the public. The same way. By, yeah. Media is, yeah. They have NBC, ABC and CBS or whatever it is. And every other company is under that one of those umbrellas and they deceive people by putting this other sticker on it. But really it's, it's, just it, it's pseudo monopoly yeah and that's one of the things like cannabis has the power to individually give people more freedom uh, and if everybody can participate you know it causes economic growth it impacts everybody positively i mean don't get me wrong markets can get oversaturated but weed has for a long time fluctuated as far as prices go it's like the stock market you know um and a lot of times people will fall out and people will stay in it's just about being able to you know if you have passion for it and you can create a a quality product then you can stay in in business without having to do pull a bunch of scandalous ass shit well that's that's the crux of it right there brandon is they don't understand weed they don't understand how to grow good weed and so they want to eliminate those who can that way they can get away with charging the prices they're charging for the weed that they're selling yeah yeah well you know further all that all the home growers and stuff that are listening to even if you're in a state that's red it's really important to keep like the same type of line of communication and conversation open because there's a lot of uh influence behind the scenes that are going to affect whether or not they're you know have the right to you know grow their own medicine i think education is really important and educating both like uh from a doctor to a a politician like i used to think of like a, a lot of doctors don't know much about cannabis so as much as you can share with them like the real research and science and ways that it helps you that can really help them better apply it when they use it same goes for the politicians so when you educate them on like how you feel things are supposed to be working and and why it should be working a certain way um it just you have to break down exactly i fucking went off the rails with this thought but but that's such that's so poignant but and what a fucked up society where we have to explain it's like explaining to your mechanic what your car should how your car should be fixed well oh I, i remembered what i wanted to say with the education so like one of the things that I heard a lot of the council meetings was, oh, it's going to be so smelly and stinky. They're going to be nauseous cannabis smells coming from these farms. You could go in and say, there is a technology today that purifies the air. These carbon filters and UV air scrubbers, there will be zero detectable aroma if we properly build the facilities like we're going to. And you can give them peace of mind by giving them, like, there's a bunch of people that grow that are not being detected by law enforcement or their neighbors. And that's because we have the ability to scrub the air. And so if you can educate the politicians on that fact, not saying like, Hey, I'm growing in my whatever, but like just letting them know (laughs) for a commercial facility that these technologies exist because they might not even know what the fuck a carbon filter is. They might not know that it's even possible to get rid of the smell. It's a different thing. Uh, I don't know about your guys' situation, but I work a nine to five job in all of the meetings are generally in the middle of the week. In the Funny how the that day. works. Yeah. No, I was going to also admit yeah. that uh, uh, people that I know cultivate or, yeah, there were some businesses that were cultivating uh, like around here in the San Diego area. And um, 
it was crazy. It was very funny because like uh, these people were growing on land that was already like an agricultural land and uh, was already cultivating various plants and such. But as soon as they started to grow cannabis on that land, a bunch of people came out of the woodwork to say and to use exactly that logic. And I actually don't think, I I don't want to tell people's experiences what they are, but I, I find it very dubious that they were like, as I said, suddenly like, oh, we were getting like gas by like, you know, terrible scents and pesticides and all this stuff when this place was already functioning fine before. And I don't know, know, it just, it rung kind of hollow to me anyways. They, they gave the same argument here in my area in Northern California, like, oh, it's going to smell. What about Gilroy? I don't know if anybody's been through Gilroy, the garlic festival. If you go through that Central Valley area yeah. around garlic harvest. They're covered under is, the right to farm, which should cover us too. Offensive. Mm-hmm. Like I would complain <laughs> about that garlic, but it doesn't, it's, you know, cannabis doesn't even hold a. Dude, I love garlic smell. Worse than that is the pig farms where they're slaughtering yeah. and pig True. shit and there's uh, yep. seas of shit, literal like, like feces. It smells horrible. So those people have the right to do it under the right to farm. You can produce a certain amount of noise with lights, smell from your tractors, all this thing. It's legally already written into the legislation for all these other farming things. But because it's cannabis, it has to be all this big taboo and they have to make all these special rules and adjudications for it. In this proposed law, it's fucking hilarious because the carrot. So the way they're spinning it is it's a way they're saying it's a way we can get caregivers so that they can sell their overages into the market and get your get your uh, cannabis into the into the legal market. But what they don't tell you is, is what you can do right now as a caregiver is you can have five patients. And what they're going to do under this new language is, is if you want to continue to have those five patients, you have to pay $500 a year for an application fee. And then you've got to um, now all of your product has to be entered into metric, even all of your product for your patients. So that's going to be a huge burden to the metric system, which is already going down twice a week as it is. And then uh, that's a fucking drain. The metric system is a drain. Fuck yes, it is. Absolute drain on resources. Huge it's garbage creation. Of, all kinds yeah, of garbage. Shit. And then not only that, but it creates a monopoly that pulls money out of the state that it's operating in. And it's it forced. is a fucking the worst. Yeah. And the terrible. thing is, they 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 hire again. They hire lobby groups. They get politicians to say, "Hey, let's implement this." They say, "Look, every other state's using it. It's safe. It must be proven. Let's and use then, that thing." And that's how they push it through. Oklahoma pushed pushed back on that. We don't have metric here. And then you can't even deliver your own products you'd have to use a secure transporter to bring it to uh and you can't bring it you can't sell it to a dispensary you'd have to, you can only sell it to a grower a, a commercial grower and then uh on top of all of those things you are regulated more strictly than the commercial growers you're not allowed to even have a commercial spot you can only have it in industrial or agricultural Ooh. or unzoned which is just outrageous and, because there's so and, many <laughs> there's so few zones already allowed by was, local that, mu- so, municipalities and, to make it that restrictive i was about like, to ask exactly how much of that even exists in that area like <laughs> exactly man. and that, and that so brings like up another extremely issue. restrictive this happened in san diego right where if they put mm-hmm. in limitations on where you're allowed to operate as far as zoning goes then the people who are in charge of zoning different areas are essentially given control of where businesses are allocated to operate and that happened in san diego where the one of the guys who was on the zoning commission board they were able to manipulate what was and what wasn't going to be able to be used for cannabis businesses and they just outright denied everybody and then they started a lobby group to try to change the laws that they already had control of, over right because you could have all your license in place for a certain area but if you in san diego if you weren't zoned a certain way you can open a dispensary or grow. And that was the ultimate decision. They would never give you that final license. And so people would just open up with all the rest of the license and they would accept the fines that they would keep getting. The, and these people would just pull fines out of these people instead of allowing them to operate because it was more profitable for them. Oh my God, man. Either that or, yeah. or pour money into the lobby group. 
So, so it's, what's going to happen is option. regulation and these restrictive laws are just going to push the vast majority all back to the black market. And that's what's going to happen. You see the choices are going to be the shitty fucking weed at the dispensary, <laughs> you know, unless you can find a few brands that you can follow, just keep following that same brand. You know what I mean? And uh, you, you might get lucky if you have a dispensary near you that carries it or uh, you're a criminal if you try to grow your own. I think the most important thing is to be the squeaky wheel to not let them get to the point where they can pass that law that allows it to make home growing illegal, especially if it's already been made legally. And for the places that it's not legal, I want to give people some advice on how they can be that person. I mean, whether you have a 50 person, 100 person, a thousand person following on your Instagram or whatever it is, if you start bringing other people into the, you know, loop, they might be willing to join you at some of these council meetings and two voices is stronger than one and 10 is a lot stronger than two. And when you start building up, these council meetings are not very large. All it takes is a, a handful of people to go up and give a passionate speech. And it was stories like Charlotte Figgy, the whole Charlotte's web with the CBD, you see her seizures and have them treated. It's powerful. That gets through to these people. And I hate to like, you know, lean on the medical so much, but like Dennis Perone in California, the reason in 1996 that Uh, medical cannabis was accepted is because it was helping people who had AIDS and it was helping people with HIV and it was helping people with a whole, you know, cancer. And they started leaning into the idea that, you know, these are patients that need help and they need to be reminded just because it's been medical for a while in certain areas, it's not legal at all in certain states in some capacities or states are starting to roll back some of these things. So I hate to say it, but like these examples are very powerful and it could be uh, a local example, or it could be a national one, but showing people the power of cannabis and how it can actually help and heal. It is, um, can open the eyes of both the politicians and others who would be activated to go to these meetings and try and make for better laws. And you never know whose mind you're going to change someday. You don't know how, there's been so many people that come to me. It's always, it, it, it's, a, it's annoying for sure, but they come to me like as a last ditch effort when they're like, you know, one foot in the grave sometimes. And it's like, God, give me a chance guys. But you know, when you give somebody some, some cannabis and it helps heal something on them, uh, you know, bring the pain down at least, or heal a major disease or something like that. You just made a believer for life that will be a cheerleader for cannabis for their entire life. And they're going to tell everybody they know that's, that's more than what you can, you know, that's more than what you're going to be able to do by yourself. And so every person that you touch in that way, even if 10 people fucking try cannabis and say, hey, it didn't work for me. But, you know, the 11th person that worked for you, you just got, you just, you just won a battle. You know, for me, for me, I would go down to the school all the time. Anytime I heard any anti-cannabis crap, I was down, I was down to school a lot. But guess what? Once I got to the high school level, I sat down and have a conversation with the uh, principal. And that dude started uh, contacting me with questions. And I was able to give him the correct answers instead of bullshit. You know what I mean? So he could make school policy over things that were true and factual and not bullshit. So you can make a difference, even though you, even if you get turned down by 10 people, like I said, that 11th person, you might make a difference. And it could be a school principal or it could be a politician or it could be just a grandmother whose son is a politician. You don't know who you're going to touch. Just And maybe those other 10 people, they look at, they're like, oh, it's not so bad. Like, you know, I tried it. It's like, it didn't work for me, but it's not bad, you know? Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. They'll try it and be like, yeah, I didn't go crazy. I didn't go insane. I didn't do anything. Yeah, exactly. And they'll still change their mind on on all the bullshit that you hear about it. And there's a lot of stuff out there that's just not for everyone, you know, and cannabis might be one of those things. Um, it's not everybody's going to use it. I, I don't expect 100 percent of the world's population to start using cannabis. The percentage that we have currently, I think, is a strong percent and it's hard to get a real estimate, but um, I've seen anywhere between like 10 and 20% in the U S and I don't know how accurate that is, but it's definitely, I've seen more people turned onto it over the past few years, whether it's a grandma rubbing some CBD oil on her knee or her neck or whatever, or taking a capsule, um, or like somebody hitting a vape pen, you know, like a, a mom at a soccer game, all these people that you wouldn't have expected five or 10 years ago to be using cannabis are normalizing it in a very real way. Like I'm seeing more and more mothers using it, like uh, how, you know, moms have a glass of wine. It's becoming part of an accepted culture where I think a happy parent is a better parent personally. And a lot of people are coming to that point where 
whatever medication or recreational thing that you do to make yourself, you know, happiest and most responsible, uh, obviously in like moderation with alcohol on that side and even cannabis at times, um, make sure, I think obviously to put the needs of yourself and your family before just having a good time and be responsible and be a good example for like, you know, Spartan works a nine to five. That's why I can't get all these meetings, but it shows that you can be, uh, hardworking, you know, stoner, as we're seeing, uh, still to this day, there's a lot of misconceptions. And I think it's, it's funny because I'm in the cannabis industry in in a way. And I know a lot of people that are very heavily involved in cannabis. And so many of them are highly motivated and hardworking individuals. Like I'm looking for the, the lazy stoner stereotype, but there's so few that stand out to me. I mean, they're probably here, there, whatever. Uh, maybe it's because I just don't follow people who have like just endless dab pages or whatever, but uh, it's mostly growers that I, I follow to be honest. And they're probably mostly hardworking, but um, I think it's it's yeah, important to try to be a good example. You never start a home grow and be like, I'm going to grow some great mids. You always are striving <laughs> for your best, right? When you start off, like regardless of how it ends, you always get to learn something and progress. And so that mindset of, of progression and doing better you can apply that you know you can learn that in the garden you can apply that to yourself um you know what one of the things that i've talked about with my girlfriend because i'm not from oklahoma is how cannabis has changed and one of the things that she constantly tells me is that alcoholism in the state has drastically decreased you know the amount of people that were consuming liquor and the amount of liquor that was kind of normal on average has significantly dropped statewide since cannabis has become legal. The liquor sales people will not be happy to hear that, but I am happy to hear that for the health of the people in Oklahoma. I wanted to share, I got two uh, screenshots of DMs. I'm not going to read the name because I didn't ask their permission, but it's kind of like, in my opinion, like a, one's a, a success story DM from one of our listeners. And then one's like a, they're currently going through a struggle and we'll go with that one second so that we can give advice and things like that. But first, just because uh, sometimes it's nice to get a little bit of positive feedback. Um, This person says, morning, Jack, just sending an update. You can see back in our combo that you advised higher temp and humidity, even through flower in order to help with PM. Well, I took your advice and I'm now trimming my first run that doesn't have PM or any other deficiencies. Only thing left is to clean up thrips now uh, that's probably a good one for Matthew to address. That says, I know you got lots of praise from many people, but uh, I'm sure it's not enough. Well, I'm not looking for praise with this. To, I, I should stop commenting. I am so grateful to get advice from uh, you, blah, 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 blah. Good luck tonight. All right. Well, that was a, a good response, good reaction. It's nice to see when we do give advice to people that they're able to take it, implement it, and then go have successful harvest. We're not just uh, bullshitting up here on a panel. This is like, many, many people have come to us with problems and we've helped them get to their ultimate succession. So it's good to see that the proof in the, in the product, I think this format is very helpful having so many different backgrounds and so many different opinions, we can all kind of weigh in on certain things. So I want to go next to, uh, somebody writes, Hey brother, hope you and LGS lady green stock are keeping well. I have a powdery mildew outbreak and I'm wondering if I can salvage my outdoor harvest any tips are much appreciated. So initially I actually sent the video of Jorge Cervantes and I said, I've seen people do this, but I highly do not recommend it. You're probably going to come across it. Uh, he bud washes with like H202. I sent that to Matthew and I was like, Hey, what do you think about this? And he said, I don't think it's very effective. And then I followed that up and said, Hey, you know, our pest guy says he doesn't think it's very effective, but I followed up with what I think, uh, has been advice that has worked for not only myself, but also some others, which is to try and make labs. They didn't know what labs was, the lactic acid uh, bacteria. And you can do that with like basically rice and milk, some water and a few filter screens. There's YouTube videos on there on how to do it. Um, But that was my suggestion. I sent them a link that went to overgrow that says, I've never had PM in six years of growing. I used labs diluted at one tablespoon per gallon, non-chlorinated water to keep plants uh, starting with germination. Uh, They top dressed their containers and trays and they use it as a foliar spray up until flower. So that was their suggestion and they've had uh, success with it. And I have also done that personally when I was doing KNF stuff, outdoor greenhouse, had some success with it, didn't deal with much powdery mildew. So I can't say necessarily that it got rid of it, but it prevented it. 
Um, and a lot of people do deal with that even in the area because I'm fairly coastal. It's high humidity. A lot of people complain about mold and mildew and things like that. So I'd love to pass it first to Matthew on maybe some thrips tips and then the whole powdery mildew thing we could have Matthew go to as well and then uh, pass it to the panel. Right. So, um, I mean, I tell people all the time that my favorite way to get rid of thrips is through like uh, the use of predatory mites or something like this, but they're not always uh, available um, or economical. So uh, it kind of just depends if you're, I mean, I know that uh, we've talked about many times before, various people like to use some sort of a wettable sulfur agent, uh, which is a great broad spectrum insecticide. But um, of course, this is not really something you want to be applying if you're in flower or something like this too. I, I followed um, up the, the question there, like three or four weeks away from harvest. So I wanted to right. add that before I uh, let you guys continue. Yeah. So there you go. So that would, that would kind of make it uh, not tenable. So, um, for, for Western flower thrips, uh, if you have, I, I would also ask, and I'd be curious to find out, I, I know we can't get this information, but, um, if you're not dealing with a massive population, which I would define as something like, I don't know, five to 10, uh, individual thrips, you know, on, uh, multiple leaves on a plant, you know, depending on how big that, plant was or whatever if you're really close to, to harvesting it might not even be worth your your time and effort to like apply something um it just depends especially if it's like in a home grow situation i'm not saying you should have bugs in your weed or anything like that uh but th those thrips will uh will vacate a, a dying plant that's actually where a lot of those thrips are coming from kind of right now for a lot of people um it's getting a little bit drier some places it's getting wetter but uh, in other places, like like over here, like a Jack, I'm sure knows, it has been getting a lot, a little bit wetter lately. Um, but uh, there are various places where the annual plants are basically drying out and dying. It's like the end of their cycle. Um, so the thrips are kind of coming out of the woodwork, as it were. I had a, noticed something today after the rain came through here. I was hiking and. There was just this really rich smell of cinnamon and I like Googled it and there's like a few different words that people use to describe like the first rain smell or whatever. And it's some combination of like the air from the raindrops basically like makes a lot of the stuff from the soil uh, burst out and your like petrichor I mean, petrichor is, is one of the words. And then there's, a, I think that means like the blood of rocks is what they used to think it was. And um, it's, it's interesting. There's a few different ones. There's like a geo spin or a geo, something like that but it's a combination of all those things. Dr. MJ might know, uh, but it was definitely interesting. It's getting a little bit off topic. Uh, so I definitely want to keep it on the PM topic there unless, uh, yeah, no, I'll, we'll keep it on the PM and how to prevent. This was an outdoor thing, PM and then thrips for any uh, tips from anybody else on the panel, if you'd like to jump in. Oh, I also wanted to say that I didn't say what predatory mites they were actually that I like to use. So um, if you have access to them, uh, cucumerous mites, or Sarusciae mites are kind of my favorite go-tos. I don't tend to like to use them in combination. People ask me that a lot. I like to use either one or the other because um, they have different uh, strengths and weaknesses a little bit, like with humidity and temperature. And also because you can't really tell one from the other. So you never really know which one is really doing the job more than the other potentially. And I feel like usually they can be, they can be pretty... Um, even as far as uh, powdery mildew is concerned, um, you know, that one's really tough, especially in flower. And uh, several people have called me recently uh, asking about ways to control powdery mildew and also botrytis in um, particularly in the East Coast of North America right now, because uh, at least in the words of one person from New York, they had described their situation as uh, uncharacteristically rainy, apparently. This was like maybe two months ago so um i mean like it does rain there and it gets wet but i guess it seemed like for that particular area i think they were in albany or something it was uh it was raining more than they expected um there are a few different agents you can use though um i have had some people uh work really well with a um a potassium bicarbonate product or maybe like a um i'm blanking on the name I think it was like a, like a peroxide or a paracetic acid mm -hmm. product. Is that like a Xeritol? 
kind of a thing like a hydro hydrogen peroxide and uh hypochloric acid is that what it is something like that um there are a couple of things like that they're sort of like softer uh fungicidal uh products yeah those are contact killers that work really well to dissolve the uh the membrane of the organism itself. I think that if you can do preventative is kind of the best case um, to where you're not, where you don't get those things, but powdery mildew, especially late in flower, the best course is really controlled removal. Um, and then you can do enzyme products that works decently. Um, but really what I've seen is powdery mildew doesn't really get out of control or become a real issue, um, unless there's no air movement. Air movement is one of the things that I usually see associated or lack of air movement is one of the things that I see associated with, with PM and then also cooler temperatures, um, when, and, and still having high humidity. Cold and wet definitely will do it. Um, I know Spartan, I saw your sparkle face outdoor and I wanted to pass it over to you because it looked like you wanted to jump in there on the labs talk, but I'm looking at your sparkle face. It looks like uh, maybe you had someone you were doing what Brandon talked about with the controlled removal and it took a rain recently, right? So I'll let you. Yeah, so this is, this is the steps that I take outdoor. Um, so I got, I had one plant outside. I got the very first touch of powdery mildew. I immediately did a leaf strip. I leaf stripped all of the big families. I it's documented, and then um, and then it proceeded to rain and rain and rain and rain, and then uh, it took three days straight rain, and I went out there in the rain and took a video, and there was no PM on that plant. I don't know how the fuck that happened, but there isn't. If I, I do think uh, it's partly genetic because Adam from 2020 Mendocino has bred in a humid ass greenhouse for years and years and that sparkle face is from his line and he has talked about picking for stuff that will not get molds even in heavy rain and high so yeah. there might be you know i think there is some validity to the testing process on that side well then i did a uh the poor man's labs or the quick man's labs we'll say today actually um as a preventative because i'm still looking like i could be another month out on harvest man this I don't know. It's hard to tell on this plant right now. It looks like I could go another, unless it finishes super fast. I could go at least three more weeks on this plant. Biological but, um, inoculations on plants work. Ex can be really, really efficient, man. The uh, That's what I did, man. I just did one part milk, three parts water. And I fucking sprayed the piss out of that plant today. <laughs> I always do uh, for our commercial uh, in our greenhouses, we spray the, bacillus subtilis trichoderma combination I have that in uh, right I spray that but that's in like the soil three that yeah so what we what i've started to do is all solid state ferment both of those together with an iron fulvic carrier and then i'll drench that into the soil but i'll yeah, use okay. but i'll use the uh the pure spore in combination as a foiler application oh nice See, I just use Recharge, which is a similar product, similar to that, and I'll just water that in. Uh, that's another thing I forgot to mention for PM because there's that, I have it written down somewhere, but Bacillus uh, subtilis in combination with that trichoderma showed uh, like over 50% reduction in PM. I can't remember the number exactly, but if that was in, in the soil, but it wasn't on cannabis. It was another plant that I was looking at. Spartan, I had another question. Matt I mentioned earlier a few of the um, predators. And I think if I remember correctly that you have a predator like chart from the nature's good guys or something that says what range they live in. And I think it was Cucumerus and then another one, Matthew. Tversky, yeah, he said. Uh, Cucumerus, what, uh, Cucumerus, or how do you say it? Humidity range or, or temperature range? What are we looking for? Either one or both, I guess. Okay, I'll give you both. So the temperature range was 43 to 90 Fahrenheit. Humidity is 65 to 75. And then the uh, square CI is uh, 50 to 90. So same top end is a little bit warmer on the low end. And then humidity was 40 to 90. So much lower on the low end and much higher on the high end. They got a better humidity range all the way around. I think it's just good to include it because uh, Matthew mentioned it earlier. And I'm curious, Matthew, if you have any thoughts on that, does it sound about right to what you're used to hearing? 
Uh, yeah, more or less. Um, the other thing about that, I guess, that's relevant to say is that uh, um, there are different like biotypes and, and things and different. Um, I have said before, and it's true that different insectaries will sometimes like um, totally exhaust or practically totally exhaust their uh, cultures for, because they sell so much because they're so successful at it uh, for their capacity. Uh, so sometimes they have to like replenish with other insectaries product or cultures or something to this degree and also um there are definitely like biocombs which i forget what that uh works out to if that's an acronym or initialism or whatever but it was a european group um that was looking to breed essentially better predatory mites like cucumerous and, and persimilis and, and things like this making them more resistant or better resistant finding uh strains that are better resistant to um like high heat, uh, high and low temperatures, uh, and humidity and things like this. So um, I think that movements towards better biocontrols like this is actually um, uh, already in play. And uh, it's hard to track because they don't really talk about it, you know, uh, for a lot of obvious reasons, I guess. They don't want to like make it super out. I mean, there's marketing benefits to talking about how your biocontrol might be better or worse or something, but um, I think it's kind of like it's sort of protected information somewhat too, until they, they really know what they're, what they've got, I suppose. Um, I think that insects I'll need a good marketing department because it yeah. hasn't been made <laughs> sexy enough. And I'm being serious about this. People don't take IPM seriously until they're fucked. So they need to invest in marketing and like make it cool, okay. make it flashy. Here's, here's what we're doing, my buddies at the Michigan Bros Grow Show and I. So we've got a little bug, a little bug fucking cartel going on. So we have, <laughs> so we order from Copert because Copert is they have an insectary in Brighton, Michigan. So I mean, you're not gonna right. get. I mean, it's a couple hours drive for us, but I mean, it's way better than coming from Oregon or someplace. And so so we don't incur the, you know, shipping cost is the biggest cost when it comes to those bugs. So we just go in together, there's four or five of us in this group and a group chat. And we're just like, look, we're going to order some bugs. This is what we're looking at getting. This is what the cost to be. This is what's going to look like, you know, and we get stuff for like, because when I started working at the commercial level and I saw what the cost was at the commercial level, you're talking less than 50 cents a sachet when you, you know, at that level, if you're buying larger quantities, so we just got together in a group to get large quantities and now we're paying that. So that's, that's how we, you can go right to their website and order from them, but they don't have anything less than a hundred sachets. Well, your average home grower doesn't need a hundred sachets, but if you got four growers, that's 25 sachets. Now that's sounds a lot better. And if it only costs you 25 bucks for it, even if you're paying a dollar a sachet, that's fucking like way cheaper than what you're paying to go buy and spray shit all over your plants. I found a deal for like, tart aimed at greenhouses for like 50,000 of them when like a lot of the things I was looking at were like 1,000, 5,000, 2,000, 10,000, whatever. And like this 50,000 one was like 12 bucks where all these other ones were like 20, 30, $40 that were marketed at like a smaller garden. So it's just like looking at the number where it's coming from. Copper or Copert is a pretty reliable uh, brand from what I see and understand. But uh, Matthew, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on uh, that particular insectary. Uh, which one? Copert? Yeah. Yeah, copper. Um, I think I mentioned it before, but they're they're a really long-standing player in the biocontrol field. Uh, I have sometimes described them as the granddaddy of biocontrol insectaries. I don't know if this is totally accurate, but I think they, it is because they, they have are, that little gun that you can like put a whole thing, a tube <laughs> of you know thing, in, and you push a little button, and it blows a fan of basically beneficial insects across your canopy which is pretty uh cutting edge and i think they're also in the drone game but i could be mistaken about that they are getting into that that is actually true them and a few other groups as well um air I'm, bug. Uh, airbug yeah there's also um i actually follow a couple of organizations um gosh i'm forgetting the name of one of them uh it's like like b wing or q wing or some sort of like it's like a uav um, but, uh, the cool thing is that's a swept ring, like a, like a B-51 bomber and it, uh, it's got spectral cameras and you can use it to like track, uh, different like crop 
uh, metrics using like uh, uh, ND, NDVI or whatever it is, um, infrared spectra and that kind of stuff. Very cool, very cool cutting edge stuff. That's a little bit less related to the bugs themselves, but um, those drones that apply the predatory mites are, are pretty swank and uh, definitely economical for those large uh, cultivation uh, fields. I and also for like older farmers that are limited mobility and like, oh yeah, it is, it's literally life-changing game-changing for a lot of these, whether it's cannabis or food, like, you know, it's corn, soybeans, all this stuff. They can apply less pesticides ideally, and then grow with more uh, sustainably using these resources. Cause to apply a whole entire field of, of predator mites might not be affordable, but if they could see, oh, this patch is getting attacked, we're going to target treat. It becomes something reasonable. And um, Think I'm really happy to too. see that future. You're treating the pest with a predator that's going to breed and populate even more. And they should, they'll just populate your field anyway. <laughs> as if long as there's something there. to eat. Right. If they exist. And as, as long as there's something, there's not something to eat, then they've done their job. And you've, your investment has paid itself off. You saved that part of your crop. You no longer need to worry about that pest. And until next time, you know, it's. Um, I, I, I will say this. I did have a, a, I did work with a corporate representative one time who was very adamant that the cultivation facility I was uh, working with um, should uh, open up their, their, um, their greenhouse walls to, in order to like allow more beneficial insects to come in. Uh, but I had to challenge that perspective a little bit because I was curious how they knew for sure that those beneficials were in the area um because they had they hadn't done anything to like confirm that you know what i mean and um you know just because a lot of places a lot of people want to grow cannabis in various places doesn't mean that you live in a place where those natural enemies are gonna be present or or at the very least in your very local area we're talking yeah. like within a 10 mile space or whatever you bend know, over and, and bend over and hope for the best is not the best IPM schedule in California. Security you're way more likely is, no, yeah. way, way more likely to get thrips or spider mites by leaving your walls up than getting yeah. a good beneficial. That's going to save you. I, well, I'm, and especially, uh, I'm on your side. especially because like, you know um, like the trophic level, right? Like the, the prey animals are in greater number than the predators. That's one of the only ways that that equation works out <laughs> appropriately. So um, you're at the very least, you're going to be working on a, um, in a hysteric, uh, hysteresis where like the, um, the biocontrol phase is always going to be lagging behind the, um, the oscillation of the pest population as one ingresses into your crop and the next one comes in following. And um, yeah, I just feel like that's, well, that's where crop scouting comes in because you can actually make use of cool uh, naturalized biocontrols in your area. You just got to like, you know, kind of make sure that that's happening, you know, and, and yeah. sometimes it takes a couple of years of cultivation to really know your area. Those yellow sticky cards and then a little uh, 10X jeweler's loop. Again, to shout out Adam from 2020 Mendocino, he was just showing, walking through his greenhouse. He said, this is one of his favorite tools as a gardener is he's able to identify a lot of uh, pests on the fly or even uh, good bugs just by walking through. And crop scouting, I think is so underrated. Uh, it's, it's, be it's awesome to look at your plants, but that little bit of extra detail getting up close and making sure if you notice any tiny little thing to follow it up and not be a kind of person who ignores things. I can't be the only one who just heard Jack say on the fly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of that, I just want to, you know, I, I was just talking with somebody about these uh, hoverflies Um and uh, sort of their importance. I think this was on the Future Canvas project uh, a little while ago. And, um, you know, we were, we were going over a few different um, like pests and beneficials. And I think a lot of people, I've said it before, I'll say it again, they mistake hoverflies for um, wasps and, and other sorts of things. And uh, especially the larval forms, they kind of look like caterpillars a little bit. And so people will kill them, but they're actually out to kill your aphids. Uh, at least the ones on your leaves that are around your aphid colonies. So um, do, I, I, I'd highly recommend people uh, Google hoverfly and um, take a look at some of the ones in your area if you can. Uh, Real quick, I just want to give Brandon a chance to jump out. And I don't know if Kyle oh, sure. have to go at this point or if anybody else has to go at the one, that one hour mark. 
I just want to give you guys a chance to get shout outs and uh, farewells before and maybe final thoughts if you have to leave. You're muted, Brandon. Great being here. Um, I just got to go a little early this week. So uh, I'll see you guys all later. Thanks for all the listeners tuning in. And again, you can find me at Russ.Brandon on IG. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. See you guys. Peace out, Brandon. Have a good one, man. Uh, yeah, I don't have to leave early, but I do have a question. I was kind of curious uh, what what Matt's thought is, and maybe all of your guys' thought, if you guys know anybody or if you have used uh, your thoughts on uh, ozone generators in an indoor grow, people that have PM problems. So I've seen people... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Matthew. Well, I was just going to say ozone can... I think ozone has some... Uh... Um, so there, there can be some problems with using ozone, right? Um, it's not, is that not like an environmental kind of issue? It is, but not. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, there's an environmental issue. It's also a, a health issue. You don't want to be breathing it. Um, so, yeah, I'm not think entirely familiar with the application that you're trying to use it for. Um, I think this came up last week. I was dealing with somebody that's using ozone to, to control smells, but um, what are you using like it for? Air, like air units that have maybe ozone in it to treat the air. Well, I personally, know. I mean, I got a friend of mine that used it. Basically what he would do is because he's got a spare bedroom at his place and he basically shuts the door, puts a towel under it and kind of seals it off and then runs the ozone in there for however long. I mean, it's not obviously forever because this is like a timing uh, chart and all that stuff. And then, basically puts on a mask, goes in there, opens up the windows, let it clear out and air out for a while and then goes in there. And I just didn't know. Yeah. And, and, and he got rid of the PM hundred percent because he's dealing with it for a year and he finally did that and now it's gone. But my question would be like, do you guys feel that's a safe uh, route? No, no. I, I, I think that that's incredibly dangerous. Um, yeah. No. I'd rather it, it, it would be like filling up a room with carbon monoxide and then putting on a respirator or something and going into it for, for those reasons. Um, you're, you're basically making it into a, a poison that would poison you as well. So doing that to your room and then just hoping that, you know, to open the window and let it all go out seems incredibly risky. And my thought is there's, it's really, um, there's so many other ways to treat it. You can just yeah. by simply airflow alone and like heat, if, if it, if there's no plants in the room, which I'm assuming at this point, because if he's just going to let ozone run in there, he's cooking off like between runs to like clean his equipment and things like that. He told That's me he even put, even put clones in front of the thing. He's like, oh, Kyle, he's like, I put clones in front of it. Works great. He's like, it smells like a like a like a pool pool room, like, you know, like where you go swimming. He's like, oh, it's amazing. So, so he's in there. You're sniffing. smelling it. That's a problem. Oh, no, bad, bad. Doc, bad. I don't know. <laughs> Some people use this for like like alternative medicine. I don't even want to put it out there, but like people, <laughs> this will so get us canceled. I'm not even going to say what they're claiming it cures, but yeah. Okay. Well, it's out there that people like are inhaling this. So it's not immediately going to kill you. I think long-term as the two, it could immediately kill you. Let's be very well, Just look at that. I mean, you don't have to take my effect, but look at the, the effects of being exposed to high concentrations of ozone. Yeah, definitely do not want to be around high concentrations. And I totally agree with that. I think that there's a million better ways to go about dealing with it. I think personally getting airflow to that room, people are so paranoid with cannabis, especially in areas that used to be illegal that are now legal. People still have the paranoia like mass. You're dealing with somebody who might have PTSD from getting raided or robbed or busted yeah. by one person or another. So they're not necessarily thinking in a, a clear mind state when they're going through these things that they're like, all right, does this option potentially work? Yes. So I'm going to use it, but there are other options. Like the person that I just mentioned earlier, they had PM on, every single crop up until, and it's counterintuitive, but I'd said based on their environment, they needed to make it warmer and a little bit more uh, raise the humidity at a certain point and then lower it at certain points. But they were able to get a successful crop without PM, without using any ozone. I think in indoors, like the, the second question that we did earlier about PM was outdoor. That's a lot more difficult. You can do like Spartan where you kind of clean out the plant and allow it to have its own natural airflow. If you're not going to set up fans outdoors, like if you're doing a true outdoor plant, and you're not covering it and you don't have fans and anything running, um, that's your best bet, in my opinion, because a lot of people get that PM, like when their buds are stacked up, laying on top of each other, if there's leaves on top of leaves, he said he defoliated. I'm sure that's probably why he's been able to not see PM after having rain. There is still good airflow through there and bud is able to go through a lot of rains. A lot of people have success 
with crops that get rained on. And then a few days later or weeks later, it dries out slowly over time. And there's sometimes not issues with that. That genetics too, man. They plant loved the rain. I don't know. That plant fucking loved it. I wanted to share the the dunk recipe because I have it saved on my phone if forever case I needed. This was claimed. I can't remember what show he said it on, but Rasta Jeff said that this he knows was used at a facility and they passed testing afterward even. Uh, so that seems pretty effective in my book. And what they did was they did 10 milliliters to a gallon of water of 30% hydrogen peroxide. And that's what they used to dunk their harvest in. And it said, make sure you dry the floor under the wet plant. So as that drips, it's going to drop and it's going to, those spores will be contained in the water. You're going to dry, you want to dry that shit up and move it, get it the hell out of there. But I wanted to pass that along because that's something I've heard. I haven't tried it, but I just wanted to pass it along. Well, in hydrogen peroxide, if I'm not mistaken, within water and within the air, doesn't it just become like H2O2? It loses the other like oxygen at some point. But that's how it's going to be working. But it also is going to oxidize your trichomes and everything else. I don't know. That's always been my concern personally with using any like alcohols or H2O2 or even sometimes oils, latent flour. It's just the press, but if it may, I hate to say it, they were able to pass. Yeah. If it's re, a reduced, would it be, it'd be a reduced THC percentage and everything, but your past, te- you know, microbial testing, that's a harvest you can sell over one you can't. Okay, so people are actually taking full blown PM flower and then doing that and then passing tests to be able to sell to market. I don't know about how full blown it was. He just said that it yeah. was a crop that had PM and they did that wash and they passed testing. They did that uh, wash at harvest. Well, I could try it in a couple of weeks. <laughs> My personal thought is always throw out the portions that have PM on them. That's just how I feel personally in the homegrown garden. If you can afford to do it, some people, they need this medicine so badly. They've invested so much into it. And if they don't get something out of that crop, then it's going to devastate them so much that it's non-recoverable and they absolutely have to do something about it. Um, I would try to not position myself to be in that spot, obviously. there's a, But once you get there, there's only so much that you can do. So I appreciate Spartan for sharing the recipe because I, in my heart, feel for those people, that person who reached out to me and feels devastated three to four weeks before their crop and they're starting to CPM. But I think if they do a heavy defoliation uh, and you know pick off the spots that are most impacted, they might still be able to get a decent crop with not much PM on there and then uh, make the best out of that. Just what about fan. the uh, what, what about the high pH water? Have you guys tried that? Because I gave that a shot for a little bit and it works, but it, just, it doesn't really. It ends up coming back in those same spots, but it does go away for yeah, a couple it, of days. It, because what how that's working is you're changing the pH of the of the leaf surface, and so right. you have to keep reapplying it so you can. You, you, it's like it's like keeping up on a res. You know what I mean? You're trying yeah, to keep definitely like a up. daily thing for sure. I just want to throw out there. Um, a lot of people are naive to this, but. Kangen or Kangen Water is a multi-level marketing group. Um, the way that they make money is by recruiting people to sell the machines. So there are a lot of devices out there that can raise and lower pH. Kangen is not the only one. They buy their devices from another company and sell them. Um, so I'm a little bit dubious on or skept- heavily skeptical of the people that are pushing the device because they claim a lot of things for like health claims and even plant, uh, you know, saving things. Oh, this will... You spray it with low pH and it's going to get rid of pests. Spray it with high pH and it's going to get rid of mildew. And they're selling it as like a cure-all. And I'm just curious, Matthew, if you want to weigh in on that. Because on top of like, if anybody doesn't know, multi-level marketing, 99% of the people make like less than a McDonald's salary. And 1% of the people at the top, it's literally a pyramid scheme that happens to sell products. So it happens to be legal because Amway back in the 80s lobbied the government. So getting back to the earlier part of the conversation. But Matthew, your thoughts on the high pH versus low pH? in IPM. Is there any uh, validity to that? And uh, do you feel that Kangen is the only source to get high pH and low pH water? I think that uh, it's important to note that uh, high and low pH can have like problematic, like it can disrupt like chemical interactions and things like that. And I think that that's a very valid thing. Kind of reminds me, it's sort of the conversation I tried to have with bricks, right? Where like, I want to be careful to say that 
that like the sugar content in plants is, is an important factor. It's photosynthase, it's the result of photosynthesis. Uh, it can't, it can, <laughs> it couldn't be anything but important. Similarly here, um, you know, uh, pH changes can have uh, really radical effects, right? But uh, kind of like what you're saying here, um, not only is that not unique to certain product, but also it really is contextual. And I think in cannabis, the, I, I'll be upfront. I haven't used a uh, Kangen water or anything like that personally. Um, so I don't actually know about it. it's, uh, it's, a, it's direct effects from a personal experience. But um, something that has always been surprising to me or that I haven't seen really address is that uh, if you are making something that is essentially very acidic or, or, or low pH, um, then uh, why, like, wouldn't that have a negative effect on like the waxy cuticle of the plant? And in addition to that, the trichomes, I, I guess um, I would be surprised that it would have this sort of negative effect on like the, uh, the cuticles of insects that, that also have their own sort of waxy, oftentimes uh, sort of like a waxy, uh, uh, residue that, that helps their uh, cuticle, you know, repel water and other sorts of, um, you know, materials and, and exposure um, compounds. Uh, if it's going to like basically depolymerize that polymer, uh, I would be surprised that it wouldn't also have other effects on, uh, on plant tissues or plant residues too. And I don't ever see that really discussed. Well, I, I totally follow what you're going with this, Matthew, but I'm not sure that it's actually like, you know, um, nuking them with acid isn't depolymerizing them. Um, I think it's just creating uh, an, an un sort of pleasant atmosphere for them to, to operate in. Um, that's been my understanding of how using an alkaline solution, a, a basic solution works with WPM. It, it doesn't sort of like dissolve the WPM. It just creates a condition where it's difficult for it to reproduce. That makes sense then. That would make more sense. Um, uh, clearly not, uh, not my uh, speciality, but that definitely would make a lot more sense. Yeah, um, I, I sort of agree. I mean, it will have effects on, on the plant. I don't, I wouldn't want to do it long term. I think that the biggest pH issue that we normally worry about with plants is nutrient solubility um, and uptake. And, and that's one of the things you, you kind of sort of have to be worried about, but that usually takes place through the roots. And if you're not foliaring so heavily that you're actually sort of affecting the pH of the root zone, um, I've done it. I've done basic foliars to treat, um, basic. So alkaline, uh, like above like 11, I saw somebody say 12, but I think anything above 10 should, should do a number on it. Um, but I would agree. I don't think it's a good long-term solution. And the number one solution for that, that I sort of see is it worked great when I had clones that got WPM and they got WPM primarily because they were in a, a cloning dome and I was keeping the humidity super high. The other time that you're going to run into WPM issues, I mean, that I would be worried about them is late in flower. Um, and I really don't think that spraying your plants with any kind of like water at that point is going to be an effective course. Right. Yeah. 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 Even it, whether it was a uh, high or low, I feel like, yeah, it's just the yeah. getting everything wet then. So I think the opportunities to just use sort of pH adjusted water as an effective foliar. Um, I don't know. It's only, I mean, I've only done it with, like I said, cuttings. They were becoming clones. So I think that there are maybe some limited times to do it. Other than that. It, it the American one is not with us this week, but he always talks about like when he was nervous to start doing foliar feeds, he just started spraying with pH adjusted water and the plants just loved just getting sprayed with water and they seem to respond really well to that it could be an it adjusted his environment to the proper zone but um something with the ph levels is i feel like baking soda is another thing that people use to adjust the ph they've used to you know spray and potentially counteract pm and if they're trying to do like lower i think it's citric acid or there's other natural ways that you can raise and lower uh ph in solutions i don't know how long term available they are or if they would actually change the ph but it reminds me of like Spartan in the past yeah. that I mentioned, he wants to keep everything consistent. It's like your plant is like a kid. They, they thrive in consistency. So if yeah. you're going like two pH and then like 11 pH and like three pH and then nine pH, 
it's going to have a lot harder time. It seems like you're stressing out the plant unnecessarily um, when there's other ways to go about necessarily going through dealing with the powdery mildew, in, in my opinion. So that's interesting. Things- yeah, because all these things that I'm hearing about, I mean, to a certain extent, you're willing to stress your plants a little bit because if, if that you know, just stresses the plants, but kills the pathogen, then, then you're happy with that process. So a lot of the things that that we're doing, but yeah, I agree. I definitely agree with the consistency point. Um, I do sort of think that pH is going to be more important in the root zone though, than, than on the plant itself. Although this is interesting. I'm I'm not you know, the, sort of off the top of my head aware of what the what changing the leaf surface pH is going to do for the plant um, and if that would affect the plant. So I'm, I'm going to look into that. You know, the thing that comes to my mind is also, um, you know, for those who are trying to make a, of course, the soil microbiome is where a lot of people's minds go, but also uh, people who are trying to avert like botrytis or, well, maybe less so botrytis, but also powdery mildew. And maybe also other insects. Um, you know, people preventively like to apply uh, bio insecticides or, or bacterial. You know, various microbes, bacteria, fungi, um, and that such. Also, even viruses to some degree on their plant surface in order to counteract other microbes and that sort of a thing. And sort of establish a foliar microbiome, a phyto, you know, a phylo microbiome. Right. I could see how maybe applying the pH product might be negative for that. Um, and I suppose also, I also don't want to glo- gloss over the point that Jack did make was that like, I have also noticed that it does seem like it is a multi-level marketing, um, business. I don't know if that's like, the right They misappropriate like what yeah, I, I want to get back to that point example. because Jack, Jack talked about uh, baking soda and, uh, citric acid, which people try to do to adjust the pH of their nutrient solution to really, mixed effect and and oftentimes that that ends up causing problems that lead to lockout um but i I think that those are totally appropriate to use for a short short short-term situation of adjusting the ph like what you would want for a foliar application so while i would steer people away from them i think for adjusting the the ph of their nutrient solution i think those are fine to to do if all you're trying to do is change the ph for a foliar application and um, the Kangen also claims like electrolysis, which they kind of like misuse the term. They like basically are trying to say that it makes more water. Like if I have one cup of water, that's just playing HTO, whether it's purified, filtered, RO, whatever, versus a Kangen cup of water, that Kangen cup splits it up with electrolysis and makes there be more water molecules. So they're somehow breaking the physics of the water cup and making the um, water. Yeah, you could know. break the surface tension by using a surfacant, and I, I bet they do. But I, yeah, that's not how electrolysis works. Yeah, exactly, Jack. There's a lot of health claims too. So it's like they use it in their garden, and then they like go and drink a cup of it, and uh, it's it's definitely a, a curious thing to me because I know that there's a lot of other devices that can do it, and. Um, like I said, I'm just dubious of multi-level marketing because all, all the health gains are probably them just drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> They're not used to drinking fucking water. Yeah, I um I uh I don't like I mean there's a lot of reasons why like your body definitely self-regulates things like your blood pH and and other aspects of that. If even your plant, even your plant body for that matter, uh, <laughs> uh cannot have that go swing one way or the other too much or a redox and that, so that sort of a thing. But those, those reactions are like constantly happening in your tissues. It's like, um, I, w- I wouldn't even know how to describe that. It's kind of like the DNA that's like moving and like, you know, reforming and, and replicating in your cells, like uh, all the various like mutations and like single point problems and like also repairs, like those are happening like a thousand times a second or something like that. It's, it's quite quick, it's quite fast, so. It's hard to really track that kind of stuff. Cheddar Bob in the chat had asked me to talk about um, saponins and their toxicity specifically to mealybugs. Um, but I thought I actually tracked down a, a little paper here that talks about them kind of more generally. Uh, this is called um, Insecticidal Activity, Insecticidal Mechanism of Total Saponins from Camellia oleifera. And um, basically, there's some pretty cool pictures of, um, I think this is, uh, 
some sort of moth larva, I think, something E. oblique, not sure. But um, basically, we were talking about like how the pH of like the, the king and water and other sorts of things might have this like negative effect on, the, on their bodies. But I guess these saponins um, are quite toxic to the physiology of a lot of insects. So they're like directly, they're directly toxic. They act on, um, uh, what do I, I had it right here. Yeah, it says here, uh, the T. saponin treated leaves cause severe damage to the midgut of these larvae. Uh, the main functions of the midgut include the production of digestive enzymes and nutrient uptake. So of course that's how stomachs work. Um, <laughs> Uh, they cause physiological morphological damage to the midgut epithelial cells. And after absorption of the T saponins, because it's a T plant camellia, the cells exhibited vacuolization and vesicle release for energy detoxification. So um, yeah, the, basically the stomach just like crumpled and died. And uh, that's going to make it really difficult to live your life as an insect. So yeah, um, generally speaking, the problem though, I think is that although it could perhaps enter in other ways, um, mealybugs have like a sucking mouth part. And I think these larvae were like moth larvae. Um, yeah, actually I'm looking at these and I think almost all these are uh, moth larvae. So they have like mechanical chewing mouth parts, but uh, so I'm not sure that mealybugs would uh, interact with it in that particular way. Are all um, saponins uh, pretty similar? Like is a tea saponin similar to like, I most notably hear people using soap nuts for the saponins and um, getting some IPM effects from that? I think that they will generally have uh, some shared characteristics. I'm not a chemist and I'm not familiar with the saponin class like in a super detailed way. Uh, but I think they have physical, like, um, what was it? Was it, I think I was reading that like capsaicin actually is a saponin. Let me just uh, fact check myself right here. Is capsaicin? That would be interesting if that was the only reason that it had IPM effects was because in actuality, it was just, I always would pronounce that saponin. Am I pronouncing it wrong? So I don't think so. I don't think you're pronouncing it wrong. Potato, potato. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I've heard it, but okay. I just thought um, it would be correct if I was saying it wrong. Is all up and then, yeah, that's how I say it. I'm not going to claim authority on that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Abolish well, Farms is a big fan of those, and the, the frugal forest guys like them. Um, it's... Um, doesn't it kind of act as a wedding agent for like yep. foliar sprays yeah. and it's also yes. good in your sip containers just yes. a couple in a, in a spray bottle of water and just fucking when it stops when i shake and it doesn't suds anymore it's time for some more soap that's in the water and you just keep filling it up yeah it's the primary sort of active agent in things like yucca and and a lot of things that are sold as surfacants wedding agents people used to wash their clothes i probably still do wash their clothes with those things man they're oh, called yeah. soap nuts for a reason. Well, it, uh, it literally, that's that's how, it's one of the big ways that soap works. Soap makes the water wetter. Water is the universal dissolving agent. And the, the issue is it just can't touch everything, like all the soil, sort of the soil that's embedded in the fibers of your clothes or whatever. When you make the water wetter, it can get in there and dissolve all those little soils. So that's like one of the ways that like detergents and soaps work is literally just by using, by making water a more powerful dissolving agent. It's not that the soap is actually doing the scrubbing or something like that, like the marketing suggests. To get back to the pH thing though, I'm curious because like a lot of people like to drink alkaline pH adjusted water. I once heard some people saying, oh, doctors claim if you get pH to a certain level that like, uh, this isn't my claim, but certain people out there will claim like cancers can't exist in an alkaline environment. So a lot of people push alkaline water. And I've heard that maybe even drinking alkaline water, like Matthew suggested, your body's going to sort of regulate to a homeostasis, whatever your pH is supposed to be. Even if you're drinking alkaline water true. all day, it might adjust, but I don't know, does it potentially raise your pH in your blood. I'm not the scientist's authority on that, but I do know in soils, I know people that have like a nine pH hard water and they just have a really good soil. They can water it in and when it comes out like 6.5, 6.8, like, you know, 5.2, like within ranges that the plants seem happy. And I think the microbes and things can adjust to what it wants to be, but it, it's making them do more work than they would if you adjusted for it is my only comment and thought on that. Yeah, I read a whole study regarding to like how much there's the amount of extreme amount of sugars that are 
in like almost everything that we have nowadays and how like, you know, that is dropping a lot of people's or, you know, whatever, our, a lot of our um, pH levels in our bloodstream that like putting a little bit of lemon in your water actually. And I've actually did that for a while and I actually had a lot, a little bit more energy. Like I noticed a difference having more of like a higher pH uh, water. So I don't know. That's just my experience. It could be those terps from the lemon, man. You're getting that limonene, giving you some positivity, yeah. getting a lot of uh, vitamin terp C. Mo- terp motivation, bro. <laughs> oh, man. Actually, uh, saponins back. are a terpenoid for that matter. Uh, so maybe people will care more about them now. They're part of the terp yeah, nation. Right. Terp elevation. Soap nation. <laughs> right. Oh, man. That guy. I don't want to give him more attention than he's already gotten. But, best, uh, best rapper, <laughs> best rapper of our generation. Yeah, I got yeah. a question. For, I got a question for the panel, uh, and I think I already know the answer. And you might have already said this in the past, but uh, neem oil versus sulfur water and dust. Uh, I'm sorry, sulfur dust and water. What do you What, what are you guys choosing? When and why? Uh, ve- veg, veg indoors. Sulfur for me. Sulfur. I don't mess with sulfur. I use a number of horticultural oils, so I stay away from it. Matt? Both are valid. <laughs> uh, all right. I know. I like <laughs> it's such a boring fuck answer, isn't it? It's fucking but... bulletproof, man. It works Matthew's going to say it depends. It on both. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Which is the appropriate answer, to be quite honest. But, uh, but yeah. uh, I, I mean, like, I, I think that um, I think it's better to not rely on any one product personally. That's actually where I was going to That go wasn't an there. option. It was one or the other. I don't use either myself. That's true. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I, that's what I was kind I'm of taking it as now. one or the other. And what I would see as the, if I had to use one or the other, I, I like the effectiveness. Uh, sulfur has got a little bit of nutrient availability to the plant. And it's been shown to be very uh, strong against a lot of pests and molds and mildew. So for that reason, I like it. I personally have used Dr. Zymes and I've used, uh, you know, Brandon's micro products. I've used a whole bunch of different sprays and, and natural and uh i try to avoid it, it was strictly for pm because i i uh i was basically tra- i have some clones that i'm i'm trying to uh straighten out because i know that there's, well, there's some on them dunk so. those in sulfur that's what yeah 100 percent. i usually do a treatment and on the last day i do like a legit full submersion and then i call it a day after that i'll say i, I haven't seen i thought. haven't seen bad results come from that if you do it properly, I've seen a lot of really good results, happy plants that are not infected, but it's not a end all be all. I will say that it's, it's helped a lot of people though. And it's also very cost effective. This is a cheap home grow Spartan. I think it showed a bone eyed thing that he got for like under 10 bucks that he's been using for years and it's still kicking ass. So, uh, I can reference it because I've seen it so many times and he brings it up on these shows, but it's, it's a thing, you know, it works. So for sure. And I'm only using it as a dunk on my clones. So, I mean, I don't, I can mix up like a cup of it. I don't even need a lot. So that's why it lasts me forever. And I figure it's probably given me protection for at least two weeks after that dunk somewhere in that neighborhood. And after that, I'm applying pests, not pests, <laughs> hopefully not pests. I'm applying predators so that they'll eat the pests if they do show up. So they're pests the sulfur, to your pests. <laughs> yeah. you apply the pest so the sulfur has something to eat <laughs> yeah there you go yeah and keeps it around because i want way, some right? dead bodies around so that when another pest is scoping it out they're like no i'm not gonna land there fuck that <laughs> speaking of that though matthew i sent you a post and i'm sure a bunch of people sent it to you so we should talk about it on the show today the somebody i think it was uh, i can't even remember their instagram name but they posted a decoy moth oh, and you yeah. were saying about insect vision I'll, I'll let you, you want to put that up. You want to put, you want to put that up. Yeah. I'll share the... screen it if I can find yeah. it. So, yeah. So this was a really, I, I thought it was a really uh, uh, cool and out of the box perspective um, and, and fresh off of the conversation that I had with uh, Aaron, the grower, uh, we had this, you know, long discussion about insect vision and uh, it's definitely solidified my interest in that those esoteric physiological things um so when i was asked by this person what my uh what my perspective about it was um i kind of had to start off by saying that uh you know insects don't see the world like we do that's kind of obvious on the onset but um to what degree 
uh, basically they don't really see images very well. They don't really resolve forms very well. A lot of insects like flies, for example, have like a looming um, behavioral response. So like that we've actually researched, like there's so many different, there's so much diversity there, right? Um, it's hard to generalize, but like, that's why it's like hard. One of the, one of the many reasons why it's like hard to like swat a fly because um, they, they don't see like high resolution, but they, but they can see like movement really well. And essentially when things loom over them or close to them, things get bigger in their field of view, um, you know, depending on that and a range of other factors, they're going to react to that. So, right. So here with this material, like, I think that apparently the, the, the concept was that this was supposed to somehow, um, I guess because it was supposed to like trigger some sort of territorial behavior. So like if other moths would see this, that they would not interact with the area. They'd consider it like claimed. And it's actually true that a lot of butterflies and moths are territorial, believe it or not. And certain male butterflies will go at each other and, and, and smash each other with their wings. It's, a, it's kind of a funny lightweight uh, like boxing match that goes on. But um, the thing is, is that I don't think that they would really recognize this as a competitor moth because uh, for one thing, the materials themselves might not actually uh, get recognized as, as a living organism. Um, and also they might even be attractive in certain ways uh, because of how they reflect in the insect vision. Uh, like colors like white are pretty attractive generally. And we don't even know because we don't have, we lack the ability to like look at this and see the UV radiation that might come off of it. Uh, some materials reflect UV and we don't really notice that, uh, but, but it's true. And I think also specifically there was um, a butterfly that this was supposed to be, um, or if I, I think the person wasn't sure if it was a butterfly or a moth, but I guess there was some sort of a moth or butterfly or lepidopteran that had, I guess the males have like dots on their wings, but this is a little bit too, um, a sort of basic of a model, I think, for them to like, to know what that is. I thought it was eye spots like on uh, Saturnity. So like your, um, like Luna Moss and those big, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, gosh, I'm blanking on it. But those like massive, massive moths. Atlas. That you see. Atlas, Atlas moths. Moth. How could I forget, right? That's why they're called that. <laughs> um so yeah, it's, it's actually something I thought was a really cool concept because um, exploiting like weird idiosyncrasies about insect vision is something that I've been a lot more interested in in the last couple of years. Um, and I also shared a few other ways that people could do that, if not with like a, a decoy like this, but with also, for example, um, if you make like the ground and other structures the same color as the crop plant, that you're trying to protect or that they're, that they're going to attack. So like a green coloration, essentially, it will really play havoc, uh, assuming it's the right hue and everything, you know, there's, there are weird little things you'd have to control for, but basically it would play havoc with an insect's ability to really tell what is and isn't a, a suitable host. Obviously they use olfactory responses and gustatory cues. So if they like land on a pole, a metal pole, that's, you know, only colored green, they're going to try to probe it, you know, uh, they're going to like not get a taste reaction that they want, uh, you know, it's not going to work out. And so they're going to move somewhere else. Um, also, if you increase the visual noise, like with UV, like with aluminum or other colors, like people have put mulches that are like different colors um, that can also really mess with an insect's ability to like tell what a leaf looks like, because they need to see the leaf or whatever structure they're aiming for um you know in the context of other colors like the background like uh the ground or whatever um it's also hard to make generalizations generally and i think that's uh that's all i have to say about that unless there's a specific question i have a few follow-ups because um something that that made me think of when i looked at just a flat card even if it was the perfectly printed color size shape and everything for the decoy my concern would be like you were talking about with all your concerns about insect vision but also like um it's lack of movement, just hanging on a thing, even if it got a little bit of movement from a fan, 
I think that like even like one of those plastic toys that flaps in the wind that looks like a butterfly that, like some of these games have nowadays for kids if you like sat that next to your pot or even like I know for birds they have those little like uh, pinwheels that spin around and they reflect light and it uh, makes a lot of birds fly away from certain gardens or even like the streamers and I think Matthew you mentioned that certain uh, pests will be in the sunlight uh, deterred by that because the UV reflection and things like that I think the it's funny you brought up the green greenhouse because as a child <laughs> I had a uh, imaginary friend who lived in a greenhouse with like a green door and green everything and you're talking about like this greenhouse now I'm like oh i could have a green greenhouse you know fucking green floors green everything and then the pests are going to not know what the fuck to do when they come inside there so it's uh i guess manifesting itself it was because i was a green bay packer fan uh, <laughs> so anyway you no know, i and, and i mean i i i think that that would be really cool to see more often now we don't see that more often so i don't want to say that that's evidence that it doesn't work or anything like this um but uh, I'll, I mean, I, I've shared uh, I've shared some reports about this, and if anyone's interested, they can contact me. It's a really cool facet of IPM that I think uh, doesn't get used a whole lot, uh, but but could have more effect for people. I want to say welcome to Noah the Grower who just jumped in. I don't know how long you're waiting in the waiting room, but I'm glad you got here now. Oh hey, uh, yeah, I'm Noah the Grower on Instagram. Uh, sorry I'm late. Been uh, dealing with some car troubles here, but. Uh... Yeah, join her in here to see how you guys are doing. How's everyone doing? I'm doing well. Just took a big puff of some mimosa, which is a strain that I actually like. I think it's purple punch crossed with clementine. It's tasty, but it actually has a Did little bit of a, a strain I actually like, as if you don't like a lot I know, of strains. I know, right? That's what I was I just like a lot of strains. On that too. That, that's true. I do. <laughs> 50, 50 strains of green was difficult to write because I've tried, let's say, a thousand just for a number. And of that thousand, it's tough to pick 50 that I really liked that finish green and that have green buds, green plants, green, everything. Purple is a lot easier, but, um, and, and, and not that I'm just into purple, but it seems that there's more of them in modern times to choose from versus green. It's kind of not that it's gone, but it's, it seems to be going the way of the past. <laughs> green strains are not as flashy. So people don't tend to breed with them as much anymore. Yeah, Which, Kyle, I'm great. curious, do you have any, uh, what's your hottest all green finishing strain or, or are you leaning toward the purples at all? It seems like some of the rock candies finish green, but some of them go purple. Yes. Uh, a lot of the Durban crosses ended up turning purple, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, I'm still, I, my flagship is still uh, New England rock candy, man. She's just, whoever she just crosses into is just comes out beautiful. I mean, all those outdoor pictures are crosses with her in it and they're just all like monster outdoor plants and they're just doing so well. Um, and I have that. So part of that drop that's coming down uh, with me and green Bodhi, uh, I have a strawberry sugar cookies. I have a, uh, a lime Morello cut that, I, that, um, that I sifted through through Brandon's material uh, way back when. And I have like four other varieties that I have crossed with this hazy kush. And, an, and a caps cut too. So I have like, I don't know, six or seven seeds crossed into that that are coming down in this drop. And it should be, uh, but I'm most excited to see what the rock candy comes out with just because, you know, between mine and his, it's like our two, our two elites together. So, um, but then I'm, so other than that, so that's really interesting for me, uh, at least it's well, for the community, not me. Um, but other than that, everyone's been waiting. So just what everybody has been waiting for for like two years now is a, a New England rock candy cross. So I have like, I just took like 20 clones of New England rock candy and I'm going to do like a massive uh, back cross and, and, and release like a version 2.0 to the community. Cause I know uh, everybody's been wanting that and I haven't really done anything about it. Not on purpose. I just have a bunch of other things going on at the same time. So it should be really exciting for everybody to get their hands on. It's hard, dude, running multiple breeding projects, uh, running one breeding project. Shit. I've been just messing around with the velvet punch and I'm not like a professional breeder or anything, but just doing an F2 and an F3. It's like, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of shucking seeds and packing stuff up and testing and, and growing stuff out. And uh, well, You know what screwed me that last time, man, is I, I had two, literally, I had two New England rock candy females in 15-gallon pots that were almost six feet tall, fully reverted, 100%. I mean, I, did a, I, sp I sprayed a lot, man, like a ridiculous amount of SCS spraying, and they just wouldn't give pollen. Uh, I don't, I think it's just cause I just let them get way too big and I just, maybe I wasn't doing a good enough job or, or what, but I mean, and I tried my best too. And so basically the whole, and I had everything set up, all, everything was in that tent was packed full of all of everything I could think of. And I got no pollen. 
So the whole thing, you know, that, that was like months to prepare for that, like four or five months. So that's why everything's like way behind now. But uh, were they too tight to open up? Do you think it could have been like an overspray? Maybe you got too many pollen sacks and they just were too no, tight to release? Or? No, because I even, I don't know. I, it's weird because I've been dealing with all different variations of it. And it was just weird why they wouldn't come out. So then what I did, I was like, all right, well, so I waited till uh, they almost got like basically mat- real mature. And I ruffled them all off or rustled them all into a, 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 um, a cardboard box and I closed it up. And I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just let them things dry out. And then I'll, I'll sift it over a screen and then use the pollen that way. I was like, boom, and you know, I'll, you know, back yourself out of a corner. Well, I did that and I, I got tons of pollen, man, but none of it was viable because I, I blasted on everything and I didn't get a single seed out of it. So I'm not sure what the hell happened. You know, just the whole thing uh, didn't go well. Might have gotten wet or moist at some point and then that yeah. deactivates it or kills it or something. That, that's a bummer, though, and it definitely is a huge setback. And like it just goes to the point I was saying, breeding is not easy. Um, so not to like belittle anybody who's breeding purple stuff like that. There's great purple stuff and there's great green stuff. And to get a clarified answer is the rock candy would you consider it more of a, a green one or more of a purple one? Oh, 100 percent green i have never gotten her to turn purple ever okay so I, you have a lot of strains and i just must have been misremembering i thought for some reason i've been seeing that one purple i know noah the grower you've got a handful of cuts over there and uh what are your thoughts on uh purple versus the green buds well it just depends on you know strain um you know i've i've actually got so many purple ones right now that i've been kind of uh, just trying to, um, get some, some more greener ones. Like, um, I've been, I got a, a new cut of rude boy. I got of OG. I just got some, uh, some Proxima seeds from Coma the grower. I got, uh, a couple different ones, but yeah, like platinum, uh, apple fritter, purple punch. Like I'm, I'm running a lot of, uh, purple or stuff, uh, uh Sherbado. I'm, I, I got a lot of different things. I was actually just the other day looking, I'm like, man, I got a platinum i got a lot of stuff that is purple so i've been kind of just some you know trying to make a switch to, to some greener stuff just to kind of switch it up so it's kind of funny that the conversation went that way because i'm definitely been thinking about that going back to greener pastures i just popped some pine tar kush and some 79 christmas bud that are going to need to get planted tonight uh, those are definitely going to be green nice. for the most part you and, should do an, uh, uh jack you should, you should try and throw a little s1 in on that uh christmas christmas thing there it's inbred, man. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I feel like S1ing it is kind of uh, redundant for me at this point. One, I don't make feminized anything, but two, it's been, they're both inbred lines. So uh, CSI Humble took the work that he got from like NDN guy and from Tom Hill. Uh, and he took them and open pollinated them generation after generation after generation to get oh, uh, you got, homogenous. You got rags. Oh, my bad. Yeah. 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 It's rags, rags. It's from uh, not CSI Humble, I should say Pirates of the Emerald Triangle. They're regular seed line, but they they are regs. I'll have males and females. I um, personally just appreciate the. I see that the industry is going this way: feminized auto flower, everything. I want to try and support what I believe to be a lot of the like artists in the game that have been doing it for decades and, and long, long time. Like a lot of the OGs well, that read yeah. this stuff. Yeah. It was in, and not to say that there wasn't auto flowers and, and uh, potentially even feminized stuff that was happening intentionally or unintentionally, even in the early 90s, like before I was really even involved in growing. Uh, some of the guys like Dutch Passion and others were pushing out fems and not to say that they were the greatest quality and that they knew what they were doing. But like Mr. Soul is out there doing great feminized work. Kyle's doing great feminized work. It's just not for me personally. I like the uh, traditional, I guess, um, male female breeding. And I know that it's less efficient and I know that there's a lot of problems with it. A lot of people don't like picking through males, but um, that's fine. <laughs> I, I'm not doing this for like a marketing reasons. It's, it's my own personal exploration. And I think um, I could sit on the sidelines and complain about what breeders are doing right and wrong, or I could get involved and do it myself. And that was kind of my take is like, I've been growing for a while and I really like a lot of breeders that are out there already. And I just kind of want to stand on the shoulders of giants and like put some of their work together, see how it works out for me. If it's cool, I'll share it. And if it sucks, I'll get rid of it, you know, but it's a fun process. And uh, I appreciate everybody on both sides of the thing. Um, I think that the fems are a lot helpful for a ton of reasons. So I don't want to be disparaging of that, but it's just not my personal cup of tea at this time. I got some random good news that I didn't bring up yet. So 
I reached out. So I made a post about uh, some seeds I got from real quick, Kyle. For- before before you, oh, I don't sorry. I don't want me to cut you off. I want to give Spartan Grown a chance to uh, give his final thoughts and uh, farewell because he's got about 15 minutes before he has to jump on the Michigan Bros Bro Show. So to let him refill his tray, uh, get some water, and let the dogs out, all that good stuff. Thanks, the Jared. dogs out on the MCMA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no shit. Fuck the MCMA. Jack, do whatever the fuck you want to do it. You're doing it for you. You're not doing it for anybody else. So you shouldn't feel like you got to breed in one way or another to fit into some kind of fucking shoebox. Fuck that. Do what you want to do. And uh, yeah, and I'll be right there supporting you. So shout out to the chat, man. You guys fucking kept me distracted the whole time. It was hard to keep up in the conversation. Um, shout out to you guys on the panel. I love hanging out with you guys. And um Thanks for giving me a platform to, to talk about Michigan when it doesn't have anything to do with you guys. So thank you for that. And uh, just growers loved everybody. And uh, fuck the MCMA. <laughs> hey, fuck Dude, the MCMA. Thank, you, thank you, Spartan. Because you may think that it's only Michigan that you impact, but the policy you're affecting is going to impact the rest of us for the rest of our lives in every legal place. There are other policies about other things for which I also totally agree. And this is one of them. You know, your, your influence in your corner of the world is going to also influence the president, the precedent so. in other places. I, I know. So, man. It, it, no, we're seeing you fighting the good fights, Spartan. Thanks, guys. And we are seeing, it's not like, I appreciate everything. And I, I see big accounts sharing stuff for Michigan too. Like Jungle Boy shared the Michigan caregiver thing. So, I mean, there's huge accounts paying attention, which is good. So I love seeing eyes on Michigan. So. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I got my Michigan shirt on today. So, <laughs> girls love everybody. I got to get the hell out of here. I'm worried a little bit. Peace late. love, Spartan. Thank you so much. Girls love, Spartan. Later, man. It is a domino effect, though. I mean, what happens there, just like the opposite has happened, metric being in like California or Oregon or wherever it initially started, then they will say, oh, Colorado, look, they had the legal adult use market and they're using this track and trace seed to sale metric system. And then two states get it and then 10 and 11 how i think there's like 12 or 13 that are using it currently and like brandon astutely pointed out it actually takes money out of the state it's money that would have gone back to the state in taxes if they would have set it up more properly uh, and it also creates lots of waste so it definitely is um has its problems but it does offer people track and trace seed to sale um, which does have its benefits i think california some people really are benefiting from uh, the access the legal market has provided uh, myself included. I know people on this panel um, live in California as well. And the laws have opened up in a way that made, I know myself more comfortable to like come on a show like this in 2018, when they made it legal for adult use for everybody to grow six plants, it then became viable for me to want to talk about people growing at home because there's a whole larger market now that can actually do that because of the way that the laws are. So it's important that we make sure we continue to fight for those rights and not have them taken away. So I was very happy to allow Spartan to share those thoughts because I think uh, it echoes to internationally. I know I look at the analytics, we have people listening all around the world. So it's not just the U S that's fighting. There are countries that still have it illegal uh, states that still have it illegal and places that just don't have great regulation right now. So being aware and uh, knowing that you can make an impact is important. And I know that normally we talk a lot of grow (laughs) this week. We talked a lot of the sort of politics behind the grow because unfortunately you can know everything you want about growing, but if you're not able to do it, then uh, it doesn't matter, right? There's people that would love to grow, but they're in a red state and they're not going to have their kids taken away or, you know, risk getting raided because it is illegal and they have a good job and they have a good livelihood that could be ruined for them because something as, uh, as most people would look at it, something as, you know, harmless as cannabis. Um, I think it is very helpful and it doesn't cause the system a, a lot of, you know, damage or undo problem. So for the most part, I think people just need to wake up to and be educated to the fact that um, the cannabis community is doing a lot of good things and it's not the opposite, but it's portrayed that way. So we just have to keep on fighting for our rights. It's like that song, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. It's kind of our, our time right now to just continue pushing it forward and making sure that we're not kind of two steps forward, one step back it tends to be a thing. And that might be where we're at right now. And just trying to avoid those big step backs. And uh, I don't know. I've, I've rambled on. We've got about 10 minutes left. I want to pass it to maybe anybody on the panel who has some final thoughts before we wrap up. I think Kyle was in the middle of a thought before we uh, saw. Spartan yes, he was. I, yep, I totally cut you off. Sorry. Go ahead, Kyle. That's all right, buddy. Um, 
Yes, I made a post, uh, I don't know, like five, six posts ago about uh, some, basically the community has been extremely generous and I just want to say thank you to anybody that's listening and that's uh, ever contributed because even way back when I've always received random packages of seeds, but I got some seeds from Virginia that are like 20 years old, uh, which I'm really excited about. But ever since I dropped that post, I had a lot of people reach out to me with stuff that was from like really rare and like uh, just really old that like you don't really hear anymore. And I actually have somebody uh, send me in the mail uh mid 90s or like late 90s dj shorts like original blueberry and there's like he's got you know there's only like six or eight seeds but i'm like i've been searching for that for like ever and i know there's like they're like intersex prone and they have some issues but i can work all those things out but i've just always wanted to obtain that and i'm also getting someone else was really generous to give me some of cushman's literally cushman's cut s1 seeds from that somebody uh somebody's father bought uh a, a sensi magazine back in the day that had a pack of Northern lights in the back of it. And from like the nineties or something like that. And some kids send me a whole bunch of those because this father's been growing them for the last 30 years and they haven't been, uh, you know, outcrossed or anything. Um, so just re some really, really good material that like, like, like your father, or like everyone's father's or grandfather's they grew up with and stuff, but just really stuff that's like heritage that uh, I'm going to start playing with soon. So I'm like wicked excited about, about that. I'm excited to hear that too because like I was talking about like those to me I'm a not a cannabis historian I, I like to think of myself as one but I, I love the history of cannabis and modern breeding especially and a lot of like uh, Kyle Cushman he received that cut but the work that was behind it um, Greg McAllister the guy who's coming back right now with the Northern Lights it has been in the you know public realm since the Sensi Seeds and uh, you know back in the high times days you get these magazines talking about Sensi Seeds and you could order a thing out of a catalog from Amsterdam and lo and behold, you'd have a pack of seeds come in the mail. And there was really well, beautiful, detailed catalogs of uh, all the strains and their different, you know, how much they yield, how they smell and their different uh, flavors, aromas and colors and everything like that. And so it's uh, awesome to see some of that work coming back and being mixed into the modern stuff, because I think that a lot of it has different highs of like a lot of that more giggly stuff of the old times. And, oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely good different stuff. good stuff in there. And unfortunately, I think a lot of um, once something becomes legal, there's a huge commercial interest. And then you get companies that have every single strain on the menu. They have all 100 flavors. You could come here and get this seed and they'll say that they have Girl Scout cookies, OG Kush, uh, you know, whatever it is, Wi-Fi OG down the whole entire list. They have every single strain that you could ever want. And so people start buying it from them, whether they actually have it or not. It sort of dilutes the market a little bit. And a lot of the people that are behind the real work that made those names famous, Josie Wales of GG4, he's dead and gone. Unfortunately, we have to keep his story alive. We have to keep that legacy alive. We have to credit Josie Wales when you make a GG4 cross. But there's 100 companies out there selling GG4 seeds and giving no credit at all to them. Um, it's like a proud moment to me to think that this is the only interview, the only podcast he ever came on to do an interview was this show. And he was a home grower. That's where he started. He was a forum guy. It wasn't like he was some big special master, whatever, growing in 100,000 square foot facilities. No, he was growing in his home for himself and picked out the dankest shit that is international now. It's, I know people in the UK growing <laughs> GG4. That is like legit GG4 because they've got it from people in Michigan or wherever it came from. And so it's cool to see that uh, the legacies are being kept alive. I, I introduced Dr. MJ talking about the, um, basically the spirit of collaboration. And the more I watch plant breeding, even in other fields, like there's a Cornell SIPS is what it's, it's like student something plant sciences. Well, they talk about like their cherry breeding program or whatever, their ch apple trees, and they give out all these scions and they're trying to, you know, basically spread the genetics and preserve them and how important that is and how basically how few people actually really care about this one and you get down to it at the end of the day a lot of people just don't think about these types of things so it's uh up to the passionate ones that are willing to dedicate their lives to these types of things and i think a lot of them are right here on this panel and i want to give them a moment to identify where they can be found on their social medias and uh let the people uh go over to michigan bros go show here in about five minutes so i'm going to go maybe reverse order this time so uh matthew gates yeah, on that front, um, shout out to the California Rare Fruit Growers Association. Uh, I know it's not cannabis, but they're doing a lot of the kind of um, volunteer work that you're talking about, uh, Jack. And um, 
I know that there are efforts like with the copyleft cannabis and uh, elsewhere that are trying to also help growers um, cultivate and protect, at least protect from uh, uh, abuse of um, uh, the misappropriation of genetics and things and making sure they're available for other people, which I think it's a very cool uh, subject. You can find my content about pest uh, information management and plant health on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. I have a video about aphids coming up. Uh, I'll probably be releasing it in the next week or so, hopefully. And it will talk about how aphids uh, locate and uh, confirm that a host is suitable. And then also um, how much sugar they can handle, which I think is a very interesting subject too. You can also find myself on my Instagram channel at Sync Angel and on my Twitter channel at Sync Angel. Thank you again so much for joining us. And next will be Dr. MJ. Hey, this was a fun episode. I like talking about the, the legal stuff. I was glad that we didn't fall too deep. I'm glad the chat came along with us on that um, and, and really enjoyed speaking about the, the spirit of collaboration and all of these things. I got so caught up in the chat today that I forgot that I was a panelist on the show. Um, so thanks to all the chatters for keeping it fun out there. And I want to tell you guys about two big giveaways we're doing this week at Cocoa for Cannabis. Um, we have a big Photon Tech giveaway for the new SQ300 um, for everybody that's in the Plant Training Grow Challenge. And you can still sign up for that, but like Flip Day is supposed to be at the end of this week. Um, but you can still sign up for that if you're not in it. If you are, you're, you should be eligible for the Photon Tech giveaway. And everybody, everybody that's listening right now, everybody that's not can be eligible for, I'm doing a, a premiere on Tuesday with the, a new grow light test. I tested the Metagrow EZ8. It's a thousand watt LED bar array fixture. Um, and I'm going to give it away during the live premiere. That's at Tuesday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Spirit of collaboration. Stop by Coco for Cannabis. Love all you guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for, for everybody to show up. And thanks, Jack, for, for hosting us today. Thanks for coming. Learn something there at Coco for Cannabis and uh, grow something and you might win something, which is fun. Uh, I know last week, the American One sent out some uh, packages that have been arriving. I saw people getting the seeds that they won, which was pretty cool. So uh, always happy to have the spirit of collaboration in so many different ways. I mean, this community is building and there's so much negativity in the world. It's just awesome to have a place that you can look and see like pretty much mostly all positivity, people sharing with each other, being friendly to each other, helpful to each other, uh, supporting emotionally with information uh, about growing, all these different things. It's a, a wonderful place that has, I'm happy to be just a small part of it. So uh, very thankful for everybody that's part of it, including Kyle, Kyle Breeder. Hey, thanks, Jack. Thanks for everybody being here again. Um, yeah, my name is Kyle Breeder. Uh, I did do a company name change. If anybody's confused why it used to be predicated, it's pure now. Just a lot easier. I, I love it a lot more. Um, I am doing a big seed drop coming up in the next four or five weeks with a very good breeder called uh, John. His name's John. He works for uh, Green Bodhi. Um, you can find him on Instagram too. But uh, So yeah, be on the lookout for that. It's a limited drop, so it won't be up for forever, but there's some really good material. New England Rock Candy is going to be in there. Some really, other really good stuff. And uh, yeah, see you guys next week. And uh, pure breeding on all social media platforms. I hope everybody has a good, uh, a good night. And I'll see you guys next weekend. That's pure underscore breeding. And also check out pbreeding.com to find those drops of some new seats. Next up, Aaron, the grower. Hell yeah. Great show. Um, collaboration. Speaking of collaboration, I don't know how I didn't mention this earlier, but Kyle and I obviously have big collaborations in the works and I'm not just talking seed lines. I'm talking, entire futures so we're we got a big collaboration coming i'm aaron the grower atg acres on instagram youtube atgacres.com i did just make um consultations available on my website um so for 60 bucks an hour you can um talk to me on the phone and i can help you with your grow so that's kind of new on the website and available so um appreciate everybody good seeing the panel and um sorry i couldn't be more a part of the chat <clears throat> um and yeah good to be here we're very happy to have you. I'm looking forward to seeing you and Kyle building a little empire over there in Oklahoma, like Brandon has started for himself as well. It's awesome to see the success of the panel continue to grow. Uh, just happy to see everybody growing along with it. Uh, last and certainly not least, Noah, the grower. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Yeah, sorry I haven't been here in the last couple of weeks. I've been kind of 
having to really like hunker down and uh, kind of hide from the coronavirus here, staying out of hotels and suitcases. But I'm back. I uh, am very excited to be here, you know, a little bit this week and definitely next week. And uh, if anybody's got any questions about what I got going on, I want to see my stuff. I'm Noah the Grove with two E's. You can come and find my stuff there or Cowboy Blazer find on Twitter. And I'll see you guys all next week. Thank you so much for joining us, Noah. And uh, I totally have to apologize to the chat because I pretty much ignored all of you this week. I, I was so wrapped up in the conversation and trying to uh, do my hostly duties and, and listen and be an active member of the conversation that I pretty much didn't read very much of the chat other than just a few names scrolling by the, the regulars that I recognize being there. So it's always good to see everybody coming back. I know that you hung in there with us, even though we talked about an uh, issue like uh, politics, which can be boring or uh, not the most sexy or, you know, it turns a lot of people away. So it seemed that we had roughly the same number of listeners that we always do there supporting us and continuing on a positive, constructive conversation in the chat from all accounts that I'm hearing from my other panel members is uh, awesome to see. So I'm just thankful for this amazing community, both in the chat and also on the panel, all the people who join me each week. I just can't be more thankful for you showing up. and. Uh, for anybody in the, who's listening who doesn't already know, you can find me, just like the logo says behind me, at Jack Greenstock on Instagram primarily, Jack underscore Greenstock on Twitter, and Jack Greenstock 47 at gmail.com if you want to email me. If you want a copy of the book, uh, 50strains.com. I'm still working on 50 Strains of Purple, so hang in there, hopefully by the holidays. Holiday season is the plan for that. But uh, you know, it's fun to do the research and uh, dive deep into that stuff and, and share it with, with all of you. I think... You probably learned a little bit about that tonight on the show. But with that being said, this is Jack Greenstock. Sign out. Peace and love, y'all. Grow love. Keep, Keep growing, everyone. everyone.